With all that being said, I'm going to turn things over to Rachel to help us get started. Thanks, Becca. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, today's roundtable, we'll hear from three different watershed groups in the Pittsburgh region. Um, so a little bit more of a focus on urban watersheds today. And I will go ahead and just kick things off by first introducing Jan Rather, our first speaker. He is the Watershed Programs Manager for Upstream Pittsburgh, and I'll let Jan take it away. Thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, like Rachel said, my name is Jan. I work with Upstream Pittsburgh in Pittsburgh, um, and my title did just change at the change of the year, so now I'm the Plan Build Manager, but my function is basically the same. Um, and yeah, I guess I'll get started once we get some slides up. Okay, and I'll just say next slide as we progress through. Um, kind of introduce myself already, but um, on the next slide uh, is just an overview, I think, of our our watershed. So you know, despite being called Upstream Pittsburgh, our roots really are as the Nine Mile Run Watershed Association. Um, we're based in the east end of Pittsburgh. So Wilkinsburg, Edgewood, Swissville, portions of Pittsburgh. And that lighter or darker green, I can't, I don't know, the different shade of green uh, around the, the stream there, that's Frick Park. And that's really sort of the, the origin story of our organization. Next slide. Um, so in the early 2000s, Nine Mile Run, which runs through Frick Park, um, was facing new challenges. And there was this big restoration effort that um, commenced because of a new proposed development on top of um, a slag heap. If you go to the next slide, there's you'll see this the slag. Um, and if you're familiar with Pittsburgh, this is what came Somerset at Frick Park. And because these were supposed to be some upscale homes and Nine Mile Run was a relatively stinky stream, um, there was some momentum around ways to address that um, so as not to disturb more neighborhoods in the, the Pittsburgh region. So at first there were discussions about completely culverting the stream, but um, a collective of artists and community members really built some momentum about around restoring the stream. If you go to the next slide, um, the, the restoration efforts started in the early 2000s. It was, I think at the time, um, the Army Corps of Engineers biggest engine, or biggest urban stream restoration project cost about six to $7 million um, and totally realigned portions of the stream from channelized concrete to much more naturalized. Next slide. Um, so this is portions of the stream today. Um, and really our work started based on stewarding this restoration area and working with the upstream communities to reduce impacts on this on the on the stream next slide so this is again just the the history of the organization as nine mile run watershed association working to restore and protect the watershed through education and outreach um, and really fostering a healthy urban environment as well. And a lot of what I'll talk about today is our work upstream of the restoration area. Next slide. Um, just to give you some context, you know, I talked about the restored area, but this is what the urban nine mile run used to look like. And you can just leaf through the next three or four slides. So it used to really just meander through the urban neighborhoods. It was basically an open sewer. People would dump their um, sewage in there. Um, but over time, as development happened and cleanliness standards improved, people wanted that to be hidden away. So it was culverted, paved over. So these are all images from Nine Mile Run in the um, urban areas where the stream was culverted. Some of them may also just be sewer projects, but they were pretty interrelated. And most of the Nine Mile Run stream is now underground in culverts. Next slide. Um, yeah, again, this is what the watershed looks like today. So this is an area where the stream might may have been running through it. This is um, just off the main street in Wilkinsburg. And I'll circle back to this picture in a, a little while. Next slide. So really this urbanization, the paving over of the streams um, has resulted in the wet weather problem that I'm sure we're all aware of. 
we're kind of an interesting watershed. We have both combined sewer areas and separated sewer areas. Um, but our combined sewer that overflows into Nine Mile Run gets triggered at a tenth of an inch of rain. So, you know, the most simple rainfall events actually cause overflows into the stream. So a lot of our work is on reducing those overflows, working in overflow areas um, to reduce the amount of stormwater and bring that threshold up a little bit. Next slide. Um, this is actually the outfall at Nine Mile Run. Um, this is a pretty big storm event, but you know something I've seen a few times in my five years with the organization. So just torrents of water coming through the, the outfall into Frick Park. Next slide. Um, and yeah, well, I'll just talk through the next couple of projects, um, how we've kind of addressed um, the wet weather problem in our Nine Mile Run days, and then I'll finish with some projects that we're working on now. So our first project was uh, an urban forestry project, <clears throat> planting more trees, intercepting some of that water. And you can go to the next slide. Um, and this is actually how I got my start with the Nine Mile Run. I was the urban forestry coordinator, facilitated a lot of tree plantings throughout the watershed. We had a 500 trees initiative where we planted 500 trees over a couple year period in Wilkinsburg. We still work with the watershed communities to do tree planting, um, but we're less intensive about it now. But, you know, this really goes back to our roots as sort of a grassroots organization. Next slide. Um, we also have early roots with um, handing out rain barrels to folks in the watershed. So this is one of our early rain barrels. Um, and we've also, I think on the next slide, you'll see it, um, designed our own um, rain barrel for the urban environment. So it's a, you know, skinnier rain barrel, still has a lot of the volume um, and it's just, more aesthetically pleasing. This is an early version and it's gone through a couple of redesigns. Um, but this was part of our Stormworks effort, which was to basically take stormwater management onto private property through rain barrels, through intensive rain garden design on private property. So people would come to us, look for a design, and then we'd build and implement rain gardens on their property. Next slide. Um, one of our bigger projects was the Rosedale runoff reduction area. So that's a big CSO area in, in Pittsburgh, um, kind of borders Homewood and East Hills. So the next couple slides are just some of the projects that we've done there. Um, this Crescent Rain Garden is in front of the Crescent Early Childhood Center. Um, I think it's five or six years old now. Plants are really well established there. It's beautiful in the summer, um, you know, when everything is in bloom. And then we've also done some street side green stormwater infrastructure as seen on the next slide. Um, and you can go to the next slide again too. So, you know, at, with our transition from Nine Mile Run to upstream Pittsburgh, we've, you know, tried to modernize a little bit. Green stormwater infrastructure is still, you know, pretty cutting edge technology, but, you know, we're always rethinking the ways that we're applying it. Um, so if you go to the next slide, I'll circle back to that picture I showed of the, the parking lot in Wilkinsburg. This is one of our um, big projects. We have a grant for almost $600,000 to um, revitalize this parking lot and another parking lot in Wilkinsburg. And this Wilkinsburg Stormwater Resiliency Project, our goal is really to take all of the stormwater off of Wilkinsburg's municipal parking lots. Um, so we'll be hopefully going to construction on this um, early this year in, in March, wrapping up in April or May. Next slide. One of the other things that we've really focused on is getting more intense with our um, data and analytics. So our new green stormwater infrastructure that we install, we try to get as much um, pre-construction data as we can. And then we also do performance monitoring, monitoring post-construction. And so this is our GSI performance monitoring dashboard where we can see things like rainfall um, and the, the, the level of water in, in the various rain gardens or in different stages. We're still building this out. We want it to be more user-friendly, more informative, get metrics like the, the amount of gallons captured or managed, the amount of pollution um, pulled from, from the from the rainwater and stuff like that. So this is evolving, um, but you know you can find this dashboard on our, our website and look at it. Next slide. 
we've also, you know, I think took a hard look at what we were doing in terms of equity and climate justice. We work in a really diverse watershed. Uh, we have some of the most affluent communities in, in, Allegheny, in Allegheny County and some of the, the you know, most disenfranchised communities. And so we undertook, I think over a six month period, a pretty intensive GIS analysis of our watershed to, to see where people needed the most help and also where the most opportunities were um, to provide things like green stormwater infrastructure, urban greening and stuff like that. So we try and use this as sort of a North Star for orienting our projects. It doesn't always work out. You know, sometimes opportunities arise that you, you can't pass up, but we really do try and, you know, use this equity study to think about the things we're, we're doing. And we've built on, on this a little bit as well. If you go to the next slide. Um, out of the equity study came our climate justice collaborative. You know, for a long time, we've been identifying areas of high of stormwater management need. Um, but we kind of flipped the script on that and wanted to go back to the communities and see what their needs were. Um, so we formed this climate justice collaborative. We have collaboratives in East Hills, Homewood, and Wilkinsburg, and they're just collectives of a few residents in, in each community that help us identify new opportunities. Um, and whether they're stormwater or not, we you know listen to them, try and connect them with the, with the appropriate resources, and then also take their input on our rain garden designs. We don't want a rain garden that just manages um, stormwater. We want it to be a community asset as well. Next slide. Um, I think this is, you know, the last project I wanted to talk about here, but we all, or hopefully all know about the incident with Fern Hollow. We're getting back a little bit to our roots. Um, you know, the Fern Hollow collapse construction had some pretty significant impacts on um, the Fern Hollow stream just through sedimentation, erosion, construction equipment. So we're embarking on a 12 to 18 month vision plan for Fern Hollow. We're partnering with the city, PPC, Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy, Army Corps of Engineers to sort of take that restoration work that happened in the main stem of nine mile run and imagine what it could look like in, in Fern Hollow in the future. Um, PennDOT is gonna be doing some restoration work under the bridge, but we wanna tie into that and you know make this a, a true community asset again. I think that's my last slide, but if there's one more, I can also talk about that one. No, that's uh, the okay. last one. Cool, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I'll stick around. I don't know what the format is for questions, but if people have questions at the end, that I'll be here. So. Perfect, <clears throat> perfect. Uh, yes, we will be doing a Q&A at the end. Uh, so everyone uh, feel free to keep hold of your questions, or if you want to drop them in the chat, uh, we'll answer them at the end of all three presentations. Uh, so Rachel, I'll turn things back over to you. Yeah, and thank you, Jan. If you wouldn't mind putting in the link in the chat when you get the chance for your maps that you created as part of that um, uh, diversity study, I, yep. I think that would be really interesting to a lot of people. Yep, I'll find that and put it in the chat. Thank you. And so next we'll have Patrick Shirey. He is an Associate Director of Collaboratory at the Pittsburgh Collaboratory for Water Research Education and Outreach. And I, I think I see his name on here. Patrick, are you ready to present? Yes. Okay. I am, Rachel. I'm gonna share my uh, slides from a different computer just because of challenge of transferring. No problem. Um, I saw your name on here twice, yeah. so that's where the confusion was. <laughs> that was why. Yeah, it's just coming from uh, remote. It sometimes makes it a little bit easier. Megan Guy is also on um, the Zoom, so Megan contributed to some of these slides as well. So Megan can also talk and and uh, answer questions. Um, can it, you can hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So I wanted to present an overview of the uh, the water collaboratory for um, it's it's the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, I provided my contact information here, but if you want to find more about the water collaboratory, go to water.pit.edu. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of 
the the larger group, and I'll talk a little bit of my about my work at the oops, at the end. Um, so the goal of the the water collaboratory is to elevate um, is to elevate uh, resource sustainability and and resilience, and and focusing on on research collaborations in the region, focusing on on education and communicating knowledge. And then uh, focusing on outreach and and providing innovative solutions to improve the health of the up, Upper Ohio River Basin. And the Water Collaboratory has been funded by the Heinz Endowments, and then uh, members of the Water Collaboratory have gotten other external uh, grant funding, both uh, private endowments and public funding as well. So I want to share a little bit about who we are. We are uh, seven in the leadership team, including Megan Guy on the uh, Zoom today, Emily Elliott, Dan Bain, John Gardner, Eitan Shalef, our uh, faculty members, and then Jonathan Burgess is our, our director. We have 37 additional affiliated faculty at the University of Pittsburgh, 19 graduate students, and that has continued to grow. And um, over 380 individuals involved with 100 plus community partners. We regularly sponsor undergraduate in interns every summer through uh, funding from the Pitt Honors College. And we now have 27 alumni have, uh, of students that have gone through uh, some portion of the Water Collaboratory programs. So one of the things <clears throat> we wanna highlight is that our community partnerships are, are key to our research, mentoring and training. You're gonna hear from one of our community partners, Renee Dolney from the Shell Front Run Thompson Run Watershed Association next. But I just wanna recognize that we're, our, our team is working with a number of different agencies, nonprofit organizations um, throughout the uh, city of Pittsburgh. I'm gonna highlight a few of those uh, projects this morning. So one of the things we measure the water quality in our streams and rivers that are the the concern is um, because of uh, of pollution, primarily the 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 consent decree from the EPA and and needing to come under compliance, plus the legacy of acid mine drainage really drives a lot of the water quality problems. Um, you just heard some of the stormwater issues that upstream Pittsburgh is dealing with, plus the legacy of um, legacy of the the slag slag dumps as well. So we deal with the remnants of the remnants of the industrial area era here, and um, all our streams are are impacted to to some degree. One of the things that um, the Water Collaboratory has done is take has taken quarterly water samples in our our three rivers. And this just gives an example of the measure, measurement of the eutrophication status. And, and a number of the sites have high eutrophication status. And it, it, it is a concern um, because of potential for causing harmful algal blooms. Uh, John Gardner uh, joined our department two years ago. And this is a major focus of, of his work um, moving forward, both in the Allegheny and the Nongahela and the Ohio um, River as well. And so a large part of his work is, is going to be looking at how, how the rivers might be managed to prevent harmful, harmful algal blooms in the first place and what remote sensing can do to help evaluate that problem. The Water Collaboratory has organized a watershed sampling day, and, and there's another one upcoming. If you want to get um, to be a part of this, please please reach out to Megan Guy. She's instrumental in this effort, plus the other folks in the, in the Watershed Collaboratory leadership team. But there's planning additional uh, sampling day later this spring and summer uh, to collect samples throughout the, uh, throughout the Three Rivers um, area primarily focused in Allegheny County, 
but recognize that that the water problems uh, do not end or begin at the county lines. Another project um, that was recently started by Sarah Haig and members of the leadership team of the Pittsburgh Water Collaboratory is one looking at how uh, basement flooding is impacting resident health. And this is a map of um, the, the Homewood community uh, in Pittsburgh and, and looking at what they're doing is looking at instances of, of basement flooding and then the bacteria community. Sarah Haig is in civil and, environmental, civil and environmental engineering at the University of Pittsburgh, and she has expertise in bacteria and uh, particularly with respect to water treatment systems, but she's expanded that work with um, with her student, uh, Isaiah Williams, and then um, the folks in the water, water collaboratory to look at bacteria in some of these urban streams and also bacteria and, and um, air quality in in people's homes as a result of as a result of urban flooding and including sunny day flooding as well it's a problem in some of these neighborhoods because as we just heard the work from upstream pittsburgh uh there are there are streams that are buried underneath these these neighborhoods because 100 years ago plus these streams had these streams had an odor these streams were disgusting and the the solution was put it into a put it into a pipe put it into a culvert and forget about it well, that impacts the health and, and quality of, of uh, individuals that live in these places today. So they're looking at water quality um, using isotopic analysis to determine sources of flooding. And then they're looking at the pathogens and, and determining the risk of uh, gastrointestinal respiratory infection uh, from, from bacteria in, in flooded basements. The goal is to ultimately reduce reduce the environmental health disparity that these uh, neighborhoods face. Another effort that the Water Collaboratory has done is is look looked at uh, the inequities in regional access to affordable, clean drinking water. This is something Megan can probably talk about during more during the uh, Q and A session if if there are questions um, because she's been really instrumental in this work. But what they've done is is drafted a report card to evaluate how the water suppliers are, are doing for the 36 water authorities in, in Allegheny County. And one of the biggest issues they've determined uh, that the communities face is a lack of transparency by some of the water authority boards and, and in sharing information, uh, sharing data. Another big concern is, is affordability. I know one of the concerns when, uh, for example, on the Allegheny River, in um, Creighton, when the um, when the uh, yeah. PPG glass plant closed, that was a big uh, customer for the local water authority there. And when you lose, when you use a revenue stream of over a million dollars uh, annually, that is a that is a challenge for a water authority to overcome. Now, there's now the icy light brewing um, and Iron City Brewing that's that's opened up there, so that may offset, but. One of the challenges water authorities face in our region is what do they do in the interim when they do not have those customers? Um, and then obviously water quality, it's a, a main focus of uh, and challenge for, for uh, drawing water in urban systems. This, what this uh, partnership with Women for a Healthy Environment uh, wants to do is, is create new on-ramps for residents to interact with the water system authorities, improve that transparency, and then also encourage some best practices across the region, not only in Allegheny County, but then fostering efforts for transparency in water authorities outside of Allegheny County as well. I want to transition um, next to some of the work I, I do just to provide a little bit of background. Um, uh, for me, I've, in the past, I've worked with um, municipal engineers to, to help solve problems of, of legacy pollution, one being legacy sediment left over from, from uh, the colonial uh, conquest of the area and deforestation that, that resulted in a lot of sediment ending up on our, our stream banks. And one of the things scientists can do is help make sure our restoration projects are toward a historical trajectory. And this includes the municipal separate storm sewer system projects because these are often uh, these restoration projects are often the best return for the dollar um, 
invested and and they they show better return on investment than some of the other solutions to reduce sediment pollution to comply to comply with the clean water act um one of the things um that's difficult to do is to imagine what the historical conditions were and so you dig down in the floodplain to determine you have to get to a depth of two meters or more in some of these instances to actually reach the where the historical floodplain was and so it's a challenge to think about if we remove this sediment what do we do with it where do we put it who pays for this um, but if we really want to restore our stream uh, ecosystems in in these um, urbanized environments it it is something we have to think about in thinking beyond these um, MS4 requirements, these regulatory requirements, one of the things we can do is think about how we can use infrastructure to provide access to nature in all communities. A few years ago, uh, I was driving down Allegheny River Boulevard um, right between um, the border of Oakmont, the communities of Oakmont and Verona. And as you're going uh, from Verona into Oakmont, there was this billboard from the US Forest Service uh, highlighting every neighborhood has a nature hood. But if you actually went to that billboard and took a 90 degree turn to look at Plum Creek, you would see that there was no access to Plum Creek. You have essentially commercial development up to the stream edge. There's a concrete wall on one side. There in, there's invasive knotweed on the other. And one of the things we're not doing well is providing access to nature, to streams in the area, in part because of that history of pollution and and safety, but um, but now we have an opportunity to do so because because we're cleaning up uh, these environments. And one of the places where we're doing it, you're going to hear a little bit more about uh, from the Shawfont Run Thompson Run Watershed Association is in the Churchill Valley Greenway. Um, I've been I've partnered with uh, Sarah Moore in the Department of uh, Film and Media S Studies at the University of Pittsburgh to um, to do some interdisciplinary work with with students in film and media, students in environmental studies and environmental science um, to set up a, a before after control impact to monitor restoration of streams and wetlands uh, and, and look at the impacts of pollution for mass and mine drainage, how it limits the fish community in this stream to just uh, two species, the Creek Chub and Eastern Black Nose Dace. Although we're thrilled that those fish species are there because formerly some of these streams are completely dead and some, some still are. We're looking for external funding for uh, maintaining some community engaged research and, and there's also a, a video on YouTube that the University of Pittsburgh created the watershed moment for Pitt if you wanted to hear a short synopsis. One of the things that's being done the Churchill Valley Greenway led by uh, being purchased by the Allegheny Land Trust it was formerly the Churchill Valley Country Club that became uh, bankrupt and 151 acres was purchased thanks to the Allegheny Land Trust and partnering with uh, residents in the community that donated a lot of money to, to make sure this happened. This is the great, the great thing about this is a formerly inaccessible space in the peak. The golf course had 1300 members. It's an accessible space because it's within uh, three miles of 95,000 uh, people. And there are thousands of people that live within walking distance of the, the Greenway. Uh, Renee is going to talk, talk a little bit more about the vision for how the watershed can be connected in a moment. We want to provide some of the monitoring and science um, answer some scientific questions with uh, a question about how the uh, how what type of fish community could the stream support uh, when we restore it and, and we've discovered that this is actually a, a still a cool water stream even though it's been impacted by urban and suburban development and these adjacent neighborhoods are also uh, classified as en environmental justice communities by the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. This is the east side of, of what you saw from the, the watershed map for Nine Mile Run and upstream Pittsburgh. This is just east of that on the east side of that map was, was Shelfont Run. One of the things I can do at the University of Pittsburgh is, is I can help uh, communities with thinking about how do we incorporate uh, ecological knowledge into ordinances. As they pointed out, I can help with restoration planning uh, water quality monitoring and ecology. These are some photos of some of the undergrads in our department that work with me in the field. Um, this is a, a image of a Creek Chub and then a, a Creek Chub in the in the um, in the uh, in the container. What we do is we block net the stream. We make uh, three uh, passes with backpack electroshocker 
uh, we identify the fish, weigh them, measure, measure them, and then return them alive uh, to the stream. So that's been exciting um, that there are fish in the stream. And we, as, as we go through the restoration, we'll hope to see more species colonizing uh, the stream system. Just contact information for the Water Collaboratory, water.pit.edu, and then my email address if you'd like to get in touch. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick. And I will just let things roll right along to Renee, uh, since you gave a nice segue for her. And Renee is with the Chalfont Run, Thompson Run Watershed Association. Hello, hi everybody, how are you? Um, so I'm Renee Dalmy and um, I live in Black Ridge. So if you looked at the map of Nine Mile Run, as Patrick said, right to the east of it is where the stream starts. So I live in Wilkinsburg, but I'm just east of Nine Mile Run. Anyway, um, in 2018, we this is a true story. In 2018, we adopted a dog who had been rehomed five times. And he was five months old and everybody said he was terrible and they were gonna take him to the pound. Um, but we just took him to the abandoned golf course. So the abandoned golf course was right down the street from my house and we would take the dog and there was this little stream that ran through it. And I would walk down to it with my, my heart in my mouth every day thinking, is it gonna be white or not? And why is it white? And like, what is its name even? And so, so the Shop and Run Thompson Run Watershed Association is a 17 square mile area where our streams run above ground, but nobody knew they were there. I didn't know that they were there and they're actually beautiful. And so as Patrick mentioned, they're not dead. So this is an example of the Clean Water Act actually working because um, people who have lived in the region and paid attention to the stream um, tell me that 30 years ago before phosphates were banned, it bubbled. So the stream was just full of suds all the time. Um, the pH was three, it was actually dead. And so now there are fish in it and it's great. Um, uh, anyway, so uh, in 2018, I discovered the stream walking my dog and I started talking to neighbors. There was a Facebook group and there really was this groundswell of support to try to save this um, 150 acre parcel. And we convinced the Allegheny Land Trust to buy it, which they did. Um, and so Allegheny Land Trust is planning a complete stream restoration, and I think it's the most exciting thing I've ever heard of. Um, in the meantime, once I got interested in this stream, I became a master watershed steward, and so I've had to do projects around Allegheny County, and I can tell you what Allegheny Land Trust is going is planning, and if it comes to fruition, and I think it will, there isn't going to be a, a green space like it anywhere else um, in the county. Um, so they've actually taken core samples to try to reconstruct the stream path and they're going to move it back where it used to be because obviously for a golf course you had to move the stream so you could have those nice flat greens to um, hook your golf balls on. Um, and it's also going to have 90% plant cover. So um, kind of after we convinced Allegheny Land Trust to buy this property, and it did take several years for them to raise the money. Um, we realized that the stream didn't end at the Churchill Valley Greenway, it kind of continued on. And then it merged with Thompson Run, which runs through Penn Hills. And so the, the Shawfront Run, Thompson Run, Watershed Association, kind of merging those two streams was born. It's a 17 square mile area. Um, and it's a part of the larger Turtle Creek Watershed Association, or Turtle Creek Watershed area. The Turtle Creek Watershed is 148 square miles and um, Turtle Creek, and I'm a board member for the Turtle Creek Watershed Association also. And that is 148 square miles is just way too big for a volunteer association to deal with. So I think it actually makes, and this was part of a plan from like 2008 to break it into smaller sections. And so um, we are a subsection of the larger, larger Turtle Creek Watershed. Um, but in 1908, there was, a street, there was an assessment of Allegheny County streams and in 1908, the Turtle Creek watershed was declared dead um, because of mine pollution. And in a lot of places that is still 100% true. Um, so the main problem the watershed faces is abandoned mine drainage. Um, and I'm this, this summer, Patrick gave us a student who actually sampled parts of the watershed, sampled the watershed for us because there was no data. We had no idea. Um, you, know, you can look and see, oh, it looks milky. It looks kind of blue. There are no fish that's not actually data. And so now we actually have data and surprisingly, the, um, the worst acid mine drainage is coming from Boyce Park. 
um, which we would not necessarily intuitively have thought, and that's where data is helpful. So uh, the plans for the watershed to continue to try to put a year-long sampling plan into place so that we can um, get a better understanding of mine drainage and then um, try to come up with uh, solutions for it. The other exciting project that we're embarking on um, partnering with the borough of Churchill is to, so the Shawfont run runs through the Churchill Valley Greenway and Allegheny Land Trust is gonna restore it completely. Um, and then it runs under 376 and then it runs under 22. But the stream is undeveloped and actually geologically unmoved and it's really really beautiful it's just completely inaccessible and so we're partnering with churchill we're going to start putting in grants for trail funding to so that you can walk potentially from um lower road i road up to the greenway um so to add another several miles of trails along the stream because it's really beautiful and so one of the goals of the watershed is to is to try to create access because there are so many beautiful, beautiful parts of the stream. But unless you're willing to go out with a machete and get your hair full of burrs, it's it's just not accessible. So um, that's what we're working on. But it really came out of just this um, discovery of the stream by local residents as they walked this abandoned golf course and and trying to figure out how to make it accessible, how to clean it up, how to make it the best that it can be um, because they're not sewers anymore, right? Like those pictures that you showed Jan were pretty terrifying. Um, and I don't know what the streams look like a um, hundred years ago, but thanks to the Clean Water Act, they do support life and we can make them better. And I'm Renee, and if you wanna contact me, it's renee at shellfontrun.org. Thanks, Renee. All right, so feel free to put questions in the chat if you would like, or to unmute yourself and you know pop on the camera if you would like. Um, you know, if you want to specify which speaker your question is for, that may be helpful. But we'll open it up for a discussion. Yeah, and this is Brandon Deal from the Foundation for Pennsylvania Watersheds. I was kind of curious about a couple of things. So back in the early 2000s, uh, visited the watershed whenever it was still the Nine Mile Run Watershed Association, um, sort of taken aback by the signs that were posted by the, the DEP, do not enter um, sort of toxic waterway. So interested in knowing sort of about the bacteria count uh, within the watershed now. And then also uh, curious to know your thoughts on the green stormwater infrastructure uh, provided some funding to FIPS and some other partners to look at the overall impacts of green infrastructure and their ability to actually assimilate petrochemicals and, and urban chemicals and the effectiveness of that. I'm um, just curious to know if you have thoughts on that or um, we're interested in perhaps uh, providing some feedback to those guys as well. Yeah, thanks for both your questions. Um, I don't, I work with people on our staff who do some of the stream sampling. I know I included in the chat, we do an annual report card of the stream. Um, I know the conditions have improved. I don't know exactly, you know, to what extent and under what parameters. So I don't want to, you know, say anything definitively. But we are working to update that, you know, um, annual report card to basically a live, live monthly report card because we're now collect. We collect. We've always collected the data on a monthly basis, but haven't really processed it, um, you know, until year's end and then published a, a report card. So I can, if I can find a link on our website, I can share that. I can definitely link to to the report cards. Um, and yeah, in terms of the petrochemicals and pollutants, it's something that we're interested in. It's not part of our monitoring scope yet in our rain gardens. You know, I think we have some like anecdotal evidence. We, you know, see oil slicks, gas slicks in our gardens and, um, you know, have been concerned, but our gardens seem relatively resilient. You know, it's not like we see dozens of plants dying after we, we see those slicks. Um, but we're definitely interested in doing further um, analysis of that because a lot of our 
green stormwater infrastructure, especially the parking lot project and the, the street side um, green stormwater infrastructure, that's going to have a lot of those impacts. Um, even the Crescent Rain Garden, it pulls a lot of, um, it pulls most of its water actually off of the street, but it goes through several cells. So we see a lot more of that in like that first four bay. I think one of the things we are interested in is how we're designing things to manage that, you know, sediment four bays that we can scoop out so that they, the um, fewer pollutants make it into the actual, you know, living part of the rain garden. Um, but we haven't done a ton of research on it, but we'd be interested. Megan, would you like to talk about the watershed sampling day that Patrick mentioned, or perhaps the, the report card that you all do on the water suppliers? Yeah, sure. I can give a little more context there. So um, the sampling that Patrick was highlighting was, uh, on the screen was uh, something we did with the waterkeeper um, over the last year, um, but we're extending that effort into more of a um, a different kind of project um, to where there's more community involvement and sampling. So hopefully in the spring, um, the logistics of this are still being worked out. <laughs> um, so in the spring, probably May or June, uh, we'll have like a community wide sampling day to get like, you know, volunteers out in the field collecting samples um, uh, in Allegheny County. Um, and so I guess be on the lookout for that. I can send information to you, Rachel, to share with this group if folks are interested in volunteering. Um, certainly, we would appreciate any help that we can get for this event. Um, and like I said, it's in the, you know, if the partnership has um, been, you know, established, it's just a matter of the logistics getting figured out at this point. Um, and then as for the water report cards, um, the water supplier like report cards, um, that's a, a way different project for us, and we're excited to be expanding into, um, you know, a different uh, discipline of uh, space uh, to study water systems, so like holistically across the county, to figure out, you know, are there are there best practices that like as water systems can aspire to live up to, um, and um, you know, how does that affect environmental justice communities, and how does that, um, you know, how can we, you know find ways to use this federal infrastructure funding to help address some of these issues or practices that could be improved in especially the environmental justice communities. So um, the report, we're wrapping it up now. Um, hopefully we'll be releasing it um, before the summer, um, maybe in the spring. Um, so again, that's a, well, or that's a partner with Women for a Healthy Environment. Uh, they've been absolutely instrumental in helping um, with that project. Thanks, Megan. And I saw, oh, okay. So John asked uh, what TP meant on the eutrophication chart. And I think Patrick answered total phosphorus. Thanks, Jan, for sharing your most recent report card. Patrick, kind of uh, intrigued a little bit about the Homewood basement flooding uh, assessment. Uh, preliminary thoughts on that. Is that mine related? Is it uh, stream inundation related, stormwater, uh, infrastructure issues, D, all of the above? I think one of the challenges here is that you have, uh, if you go to that, section of homework and I recently took a class there and they're looking they're members of the community looking to find ways to convert green space here on the top of the hillside into stormwater catchment basins and so there's a lot of neighborhood initiative to solve the stormwater problem and it's in part because every time it rains people have water coming in their basements like a lot of people in in this region and so it's it's mostly driven by stormwater the fact that um we have a lot of uh, hard surface and not a lot of places for water to infiltrate. And so it's going to flood into the 
the basements. Um, Megan may know a little bit more about what they found so far than I do, but um, it's largely due to that the fact that the headwaters are buried. Yeah, and I'll just add on that. I, I think they're still sampling. I don't know that we have a ton of results yet, but this is a, kind of a pilot study that could be something bigger potentially later on. I think right now it's like 50 samples and 50 homes. Um, and we're focusing um, in uh, two different neighborhoods. One of them's Homewood and I'm totally blanking on the other one, but um, to have you know a control and uh, to see what kind of uh, differences there might be between the different neighborhoods. Um, so uh, yeah, the, it's not really something that we know a super ton about yet, um, but more information to come for sure. There any other questions for any of our speakers? Yeah, Rachel, if I can just throw this out there. Uh, so the Foundation for Pennsylvania Watersheds also uh, administers in partnership with the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission, the Unassessed Waters Program. So I've heard a little bit about you know, cold water resources and, and certainly the urban environment. Uh, last year, we were able to expand some funding to look at more urban areas. Uh, so if there are streams that you're aware of that support wild trout populations that have not been assessed, certainly uh, you could shoot those over to us. Uh, that actually gets vetted through the Fish and Boat Commission. Uh, and then collaborators go out and actually do the assessment based on that Fish and Boat Commission protocol. So uh, you know, oftentimes the, the urban environment's kind of been overlooked because of those reasons that we've talked about today. The streams are culverted. There's not necessarily habitat for wild trout, but at the same time, we, we know that there are areas that have wild trout within the urban environment. So those areas we wanna document. Uh, and if you're not aware, the importance of that is, is really through chapter 93. So if wild trout populations are you know, found and, and those areas are documented, that actually allows for increased protections through permitting for those resources. So exceptional value streams, uh, that classify under the cold water program, all of the wetlands associated with those streams get exceptional value wetlands uh, designations, uh, et cetera. So it's, it's really important for us to try to find those streams, document those streams, and to get them the upgraded protection. So uh, again, we're, we pretty much got those locked and loaded for 2023, but uh, if you're aware of areas that you think should be considered or you have data that shows that wild trout populations exist in some of those watersheds, uh, by all means, shoot them over. You know, I'll put my consulting address in the chat just simply because it's a lot shorter than the one that I have for the foundation. <laughs> and then uh, certainly happy to follow up with you and forward that information over to uh, the Fish and Boat Commission if, if you have uh, streams that you think might actually qualify. So appreciate the help with that as well. Brandon, could you qualify or clarify, do these streams have to currently have known wild trout or just a potential? No, uh, so what, what the game plan is, is that um, we're kind of looking for those streams that we think. Uh, so there's, there's kind of two aspects of it. Um, the sampling is based on think. Uh, part of that's based also on historic range. So the the DE, uh, not the DEP, sorry, the Fish and Boat Commission actually looks at that through sort of about three lenses to sort of prioritize. So it, it's really based on areas that have either had historic populations of wild trout. Uh, there's been some data that's come back to them that seems to indicate that there's a population of wild trout. And then three, you know, they'll, they'll look at sort of a, a GIS based platform to say, okay, well, we've got wild trout in this watershed and we've got similar 
uh, maybe land characteristics and and all of those sorts of things in adjacent watersheds and then try to do it that way uh, there's a, a really neat thing that's written into the rules and regulations for the nss waters program that allows for trib connectivity uh, so basically the, the main stem of Rachel Run has uh, a wild trout population, and then there are five tributaries that tie into that that are upstream of the sampling point uh, on Rachel Run where wild trout were detected. So all five of those tributaries through the, the trib connectivity get special protection uh as well because it's just assumed that un unless there's some sort of physical barrier to those five tributaries that the point where the wild trout were actually found uh, everything upstream of that gets uh the protection and the the classification so it's a it's a pretty neat program um collaborators too uh those those are organizations uh that are, that are not for profit so typically our collaborators are, are colleges and, and universities. And uh, we just introduced and recruited in through 3RQ at West Virginia University to do some work down closer to the Mason Dixon uh, this year as we've expanded those uh, initiatives too. So, you know, really kind of uh, another sort of piece of that and, and not to have a brand and soliloquy is to uh, just say that. The DEP does an evaluation and an assessment for waters uh, as it relates to the, the Clean Water Act. So are, are we attaining for, you know, fishable, swimmable, whatever that designation is for a stream? This is separate from that. So of those 86,000 miles of stream assessed in, in Pennsylvania, I think we're just now somewhere on the, the plus side of about 50% of those then being assessed for wild trout populations. So that's kind of a, a little bit of the difference. A lot of people kind of confuse that and they're like, what in the world? We, we haven't assessed all of the waters in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, the other sort of footnote to that, and I see people nodding their heads, is that through the integrated waters list, uh, if you look at that for Pennsylvania, less than 50% of the waters in the state of Pennsylvania have actually been assessed for recreational use uh, as well. So, you know, there's there's a lot of work to do in terms of catching up with our, our water quality policies within the state of Pennsylvania. Thanks, Brandon. Yep. All right. Well, so I'll put a quick plug in for our next session, which will be February 16th at 10 a.m. Uh, and you should be registered for that through your registration already. Um, but this session will focus on larger scale collaborative efforts within the Upper Ohio River Basin. Um, and so that will include, um, you know, a effort of Isaac Walton Lee to create a, a photo map of the Monongahela River, which will be explained a lot better, <laughs> um, but it's pretty cool. And we'll also hear from John Wenzel who's on the call today from the Kahnema Valley Conservancy. And so I will just leave it open for any last minute questions or comments. Uh, Becca, is there anything you'd like to add? Nope, just we can give a hand to our presenters. Uh, they did a really good job. And also thanks to all of you for good questions and comments and just a really great discussion it's been very, very stimulating. <laughs> yes, thank you to all of our speakers. And thanks for attending. Right. Bye, everyone. Thank you.